Welcome to our virtual space, where thought leaders who in a variety of ways have committed themselves to improving our lives, share their work, perspectives on current affairs, and what brought them to where they are today. My name is Rob Liu, and this is The Exchange. Caroline, thank you so much for joining us on The Exchange. I know that our viewers and listeners will be very excited to hear, hear your perspective, because as you know, The Exchange is really focused on diving into how various fields are actually intersecting with and affected by what's happening with the COVID-19 pandemic. So to sort of set the stage for our viewers and listeners, can you share with us sort of what you do at Rice University. Thank you, Rob. Yes, I am both faculty at Rice University, Carlson Professor of Humanities, and also Vice President for Digital and Global Strategy. So I have both an academic and an administrative role. So I think one thing that people are always really interested in is, how did Caroline Lavander end up in that role? Right now, of course, as you mentioned, there are two critical pieces. There's your role as a university leader, and there's your role as a scholar. So maybe let's focus for now on the scholar sort of part of things. Um, quite often, there's something that happened in your childhood, maybe in your early life as an adult, that you can almost point to and say, you know what, that's when my passion, for example, in your case, for English literature and the humanities really came into being. Can you share that with us, when that might have happened for you? That's a great question, Rob. And let me begin by saying I grew up on college campuses during civil rights. My father was an art professor at University of Washington in Seattle. And so I found universities amazingly dynamic places where uh, human rights, social justice were um, were principles that people uh, fought for and defended with great passion and conviction. And so I found the life of academia to be one that was really invigorating and exciting. And uh, my own, I think, clarity around literature and literary uh, scholarship as my focus was very much not an active decision I made, but just a lifelong love. So. Um, I was the kid that was always reading the, the nerdy books um, when other people were out playing. And um, I think what I just loved was the, the, the beauty of words on a page. Um, and I was fascinated with how strings of words uh, could yield so much more than the sums of their parts. That said, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I think the most important course that I took was logic. Um, so it wasn't, you know, um, Renaissance literature or medieval literature, but it was a logic course where um, the architecture, the scaffolding of argumentation was the focus and uh, the ways in which persuasion worked vis-a-vis um, -vis a kind of set of physical principles, philosophical principles, I found very compelling. Ah, oh, fantastic. So I think for so many of us, then, the sort of a life in reading is always a critical starting point, mm -hmm. right? Where how we actually engage with the field, how we get sort of excited. And so I was a reading nerd as well <laughs> when I was a child. I mean, in some ways, um, fiction and even nonfiction was kind of a, a particular escape for mm -hmm. me into worlds that were so different from my own. So I can certainly sympathize and, and really understand that driver sort of early on in childhood. But so clearly then you dived into the humanities, into literature, and you have written very broadly, right, in, that, you know, in those fields. But quite often, one of the questions that folks often ask is, well, how does a scholar that is so focused on her work and has done so much in her field what triggers someone like that to become involved with university leadership and administration? I mean, how does that happen, right? There's always the sense that scholars want to 
sort of lock down in their offices and focus on the things that they care about the most and, you know, let the rest of the world figure itself out. Um, how did this, not transition, but this sort of addition to who you are happen? Another great question. Uh, I didn't plan to be an administrator. It was not a conscious decision. I think it happened very organically. I was invited to lead the Humanities Research Center at Rice. And I thought long and hard about that. Uh, it seemed really interesting and very uh, meaningful work that I could do for humanities colleagues. So I think that was my entree. I found that I, I loved talking with people outside of my discipline and that I became very fascinated with the assumptions, the critical assumptions, the protocols, the uh, methodologies of different disciplines, both proximate to my own, but also sort of radically dissimilar. And so I found that actually invigorating and very revealing of some of the hidden assumptions in my discipline and also some of the assumptions that had been guiding my work. So I found that my own research and writing was really strengthened by that administrative work. It was focused very much on uh, creating scholarly communities of diverse uh, thought partners. It was also, you know, very focused on the nuts and bolts of building communities. So, as you know, what it takes to stand up a really successful conference and how do you logistically get people from around the world to all convene and, uh, you know, put their best foot forward into a really thorny intellectual or academic question. So, I learned a lot of just practical stuff along the way that I also found pretty remarkable. I mean, I had been a typical faculty member who would walk into a classroom just assuming the lights would go on, that the electricity was, you know, was in place, that all of these smart students were on time and ready to learn. And I'd never really thought about the back of store of a university before. And so that I thought was kind of my my limitation and so i started to see universities or at least the one i was working in as these really complicated businesses with wow. all kinds of people mm -hmm. um, that aren't staff that aren't students but that really matter to the success of a campus community yeah. so one of the things that you've really touched on i think very effectively is that quite often there's a tendency to think that universities do research and they do teaching and that's just all they do. And we know what that looks like on both sides of that coin, sort of research and teaching. But in your leadership role at Rice University, you think very carefully about strategy, mm -hmm. right? And in particular as well, I believe, strategy in and the ways in which it connects with the digital. So to have someone like you that is so broad in your interests and so open to and enthusiastic about connections between fields. Can you say a little bit about how that characteristic of yourself feeds into how you think about strategy for your institution, for your great institution? Well, people still sort of, including my boss, the president, um, still sort of laughs and, and says, you know, gosh, you're an unlikely English professor <laughs> um, as, you know, I do things like um, reimagine the business model for our summer school, for example, when we move this summer to entirely online. Mm -hmm. um, and it is unlikely, but as I say, you know, it's also completely uh, to be expected that, you know, minds that like to problem solve in one context can apply those problem solving skills to all kinds of different contexts. And I think in terms of setting strategy, um, you know, it's strategy is, is not ever without its context, without the limitations, the practicalities of a certain situation. And so, you know, we set strategy within constraints. 
And so I do think understanding constraint is a necessary but not sufficient condition for being able to set really effective strategies. So maybe my early, you know, uh, years of uh, learning the nuts and bolts of a university then become a really helpful um, tool in the toolkit of strategy setting. Yeah. So speaking of strategy, given what we're facing in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, given the spring term switch that all of our institutions had to do from the brick and mortar classroom to I'm teaching and learning online, and because of your um, leadership role at the university at Rice, when it comes to thinking about um, digital and how that plays into the future of learning at Rice, can you share some insights, some battle stories, <laughs> some <laughs> sort of perspectives that you now have based on what must have been an amazing spring term for you? Well, it was. You know, we started spring semester with six entirely online courses uh, you know, during the spring. And we thought that was, that was pretty ambitious. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, by spring break, uh, we were deep in the process of migrating over 1900 courses entirely to online delivery for the rest of the semester. And throughout that truly vertigo inducing process, I will tell you, um, I was, hourly grateful for the years of preparation that we had sort of inadvertently uh, created in our community. So for example, you know, we developed a university policy for distance education back in 2017. And at the time, you know, none of us were thinking that it would be relevant to a situation such as the one we have right now, but it has been such a helpful guiding set of principles as we you know, march into really kind of unimaginable terrain. Um, I would say in that process of migration, the faculty were remarkable. Uh, we couldn't have done it without the really heroic willingness of people to do things that they wouldn't have thought imaginable. And so, you know, faculty um, in the visual and dramatic art department, for example, you know, sending me emails saying, there is no way that I can teach printmaking online. There's just no way this can happen. Um, I would say then, you know, that very same senior faculty member, after spending an hour with one of the staff in my Rice Online Learning team, really had a transformed understanding of what was possible um, and came out with, you know, a really elegant, a solution for the last half of her course. Now, you know, it's not the way she wanted it to go. Um, and, you know, she continued to feel really angry and frustrated about having to make those adjustments, but she made them. And I think that is now a, a resilience and a kind of capability that not just that faculty, but kind of all the faculty that we have at Rice now bring to thinking about the, the present and the future in a COVID era, which you know, is not what we want for sure. Uh, no one wants to be living in such a, you know, terrible and terrifying environment. But I think we do have a, a, a capability, a skill set now that we didn't have before. Yes. So along those lines, um, of course, there's still so much that we don't know, right? We're still trying to understand both the virus and the disease that it causes. There are many unknowns sort of about that. There are even more unknowns around the overall long-lasting impact. You know, this will have on virtually every aspect of our lives in society that we can think of. So this is a tough question to ask right now at this moment, but is there something that you feel in the realm of education, in the realm of teaching and learning, that you think will likely emerge from this experience? Well, I think there are a number of things that will emerge. One, I think we will be in, a, in an education sector that is just more blended. I think this idea of on-premise or online mm -hmm. is a pre-COVID concept. So I really think we will be um, coming back to our campuses, not in an either or, uh, mindset or framework, but really thinking about how can we use 
online tools, capabilities, uh, assets moving forward. I just don't think there's any going back after the migration of 900, 1900 courses online. You know, I think once you open that door, you can't really close it again. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually think that's a good thing because I think building a resilient ecosystem for education is so important um, moving forward in, in these days and times. You know, I think our students as well will come back to the classroom aware that it is a more um, integrated environment than they had assumed before. So, um, you know, it's early days on that, but we're already starting to see, you know, some students at Rice who were, for health reasons, before COVID happened, actually thinking they were going to stay home and take courses at the, you know, local college, suddenly with what we're doing in the fall, which we're calling dual delivery, suddenly those students are saying, hey, I can continue at Rice. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm going to be living elsewhere, I'll just take my courses online. And that's so much better for them than taking courses somewhere else and transferring those in. Yes. Um, so that model of greater student flexibility and mobility, I could imagine being part of our near future. So even when COVID is passed, the crisis is passed, we might have students who say, you know, I really want to take a semester and live in city X. Mm -hmm. Can I continue to be a full-time enrolled student in a highly residential campus model? And I would hope the answer would be yes. Okay, fantastic. So that certainly will be a change. Um, I was on a panel yesterday where I expressed one concern related to that possible future, which is that, um, let's face it, the version of online learning that has been executed in many situations is potentially not ideal. Mm -hmm. I would say no one's to blame. They, in some cases, there were like 48 hours or 72 hours to make the pivot, right, from in the classroom to online. And one of my concerns is that there's a temptation to think that, well, online learning is a thing, right? It's a specific singular thing. It's kind of like saying that in-classroom teaching is a singular thing. And that therefore that singular thing is either good or it's bad. When in fact, in any environment, you have bad teaching online and good teaching online. You have bad classes in the classroom and you have good classes in the classroom. And this sort of um, possible sense now that students were dissatisfied, and I mean broadly, right, sort of across the nation, that if online is a big part of the fall, we don't want to come back, sort of, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you, like me, worry a little bit that the opportunity to finally get the the sort of the potential of online education more integrated into what we do could be squandered by a negative backlash based on what happened in the spring? You know, I would have thought that, Rob. Um, and many people did say that that's exactly what would happen during summer and during uh, our summer school. Mm -hmm. So we did a big experiment this summer. We moved, you know, not just the spring courses, the rest of the spring courses entirely online, but we decided to pull down our summer school schedule and rebuild it with entirely online courses. So we have about 130 courses online this summer. And, you know, many said, look, these students, they're just tired of taking the rest of the semester online, they're gonna go do something different. They have Zoom fatigue, they're, they're just done. Um, in fact, we have seen a remarkable uh, number of students taking our summer school courses online. And it's hard to know why that is, you know? Um, is it that there weren't other internship opportunities or summer employment fell through, summer travel was you know, not possible? And so continuing to take courses for credit and make progress towards their degree sort of became the thing that people did. 
you know, I'm sure that's part of it. On the other hand, you know, we may be seeing the beginning of a new set of habits and behaviors where online education gets better. People learn how to do it better. They learn how to be in a class as a student over time so that the, the experience slowly begins to improve. And then the benefits that come with that uh, flexibility start providing a real incentive to persist. Um, so maybe that's the optimist in me. I tend to be quite optimistic about these things. And I am not going to say, <laughs> I am not going to say that all online uh, teaching is, you know, the same as face to face. I think it so depends on the discipline, the subject, uh, the goals of the class. Um, but I, I do think that we are all now getting a big education in what might be possible. Yes. And so I would hope that the jury continues to be out and we build real muscle in this, intelligent muscle. Absolutely. So, of, of course, as you know, you know that we're both optimists. <laughs> so I, so I do share your, your optimistic view of what the future holds for this. So, Caroline, thinking about now your perspective as an English professor, um, it's often said, and I've said this, that there's almost no field or facet of our lives that this COVID-19 pandemic will not change. That ultimately we're looking at the most significant public health threat, sort of systemically, that we're faced in 100 years. Um, in terms of the humanities, and I would just say perhaps the critical role that the humanities plays in processing and sort of interrogating critical historical events like this. As an English professor, what do you think COVID-19 will mean for your field? I think it's a huge opportunity. I, I am currently writing a book, the title of which is Undisciplined Science and the Future of the Humanities in the 21st Century. I started writing it before COVID um, but COVID has been, I think, a, an amazing canvas against which to think about the, the themes and the, the arguments of that book, um, because I think what we know, you know, Tony Fauci is a great example of, a, you know, very important scientist whose early training in classics and art um, was so compelling to him that he was really torn between, you know, what career path to take. Um, but, you know, I think, I think that kind of orientation towards the human, um, the qualitative practices that make for deep and abiding uh, human uh, interaction and sophisticated, uh, compassionate perspectives as we deal with these large-scale catastrophes, um, you know, that is something we absolutely have to cultivate in our population if we are really to look back on this time and say, you know, as a, as a human population, we did this as, as best as we could. We really did this well. And so I think this is a, a big opportunity to really focus on the key subjects and interests and themes that the humanities have long grappled with. You know, what are the ethical implications of uh, contact tracing? What counts as quality of life and sufficient surveillance to protect human rights and privacy in an era of COVID? These kinds of questions are very important um, and needed dimensions of decision-making that is happening right now. I certainly think the humanities, um, and it's not just me who thinks this, you know, must work side by side with scientists in dealing with these, um, with these real challenges we face. Um, not to mention, you know, just kind of the ethical implications of large-scale want, unemployment, um, poverty, hunger, you know, how do we count, counterbalance those kind of human uh, extremities with things that are, you know, um, biological and 
Mm -hmm. Those are really complicated questions. Yes. So I think, I mean, you know how excited I am about that kind of intersection that you've just um, described. I, I believe we, we talked about this sort of a while back, um, probably over a glass of wine. Um, that probably I, in Paris. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very interested in the ways that the perspectives, the maneuvers, the analytical tools, but also the emotional frameworks that are provided by the humanities really provide for science a profound level of understanding that can go beyond structures and processes and facts and figures, et cetera, in terms of understanding what's happening. So I think we had talked about my spring course, which is focused on cell biology and human disease in a global setting. And I remember sharing with you that creative writing is actually a critical part of it, where there are historical fictions, which I've built that thread through it, and students actually need to create their own historical fictions um, that can take place in any part of the world with, with, you know, basically during any period that really allows them to interrogate the intersection of how our understanding of biology allows us to understand some aspect of society, human disease, public health, the action or inaction of government and how those things intersect. And to me, what I've always found is that the humanities bring an intuition and a, a deep-seated, heartfelt understanding to um, situations unlike anything else. And so for me, one of the things I really hope is that at this moment in COVID-19, we don't wait for the sciences and the humanities to get together, where the humanities become like a secondary later stage frosting on science to understand what's going on. If we think about sort of the, eth it's not just about the ethics, it's about truly the understanding the human dimension of what's happening. Absolutely. The, you know, the feelings of fear, the feelings yes. of isolation, uh, sadness, euphoria, these feelings are not discipline specific, yes. but they are powerful drivers uh, at our current time. And uh, really being wise, not just smart, but wise about those is integral to making it through this period with creativity and durability, endurance, um, and, and majesty, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's fair to say that if we look at where we are now as an individual, in our careers, in our passions, etc., and we trace back through our sort of life history, along the way, there are many crossroads that we encounter, where you turn left or you turn right. And those turns, those decisions, those forks in the road, really had a formative impact on where we are today. If you think back across the life history of Caroline, can you think of a fork in the road where you went left, where if you had gone right, in an alternate universe, in the multiverse, there would be a Caroline doing something very different right? Is there such a crossroads that you could share with us? And in the alternate universe, what would that Caroline Lavander be doing? Well, I like to think she wouldn't be as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but I could be wrong on that one. <laughs> I mean, clearly, you're the best in the most. <laughs> but that's not. <laughs> you know, I made a decision when I was a student to take a year and to study abroad. And I embedded myself in a university. So I didn't do a, you know, like a university, a US university sponsored study abroad where you're with people like you um, and you, maybe you're only there for a semester. I went for a full year and, um, and I was at the University of Durham. And that 
whatever I thought it was going to be, it was very confirming to me of a couple of, of kind of key hunches I had about myself. One, that I really love literature and the life of the mind was the life for me because I took, you know, all literature, three courses for an entire year, mm. you know, one exam at the end, the, the British system. And the other thing I hadn't understood about myself, but that was revealed to me is that um, I'm, a, I'm a world citizen. So I am a, a person who is deeply local in my communities and deeply global in my connectedness. Mm -hmm. And so I hadn't known that about myself, but that revelation, I think, then really set the direction for much of the rest of my decision-making. So when I did graduate from college, I uh, worked for the Japanese Ministry of Education in Niigata Ken for two years. So I you know, did a sort of unexpected thing. I'd never been to Japan, but I moved there and had a wonderful time working uh, in the ministry office. Um, it was, you know, a deep immersion experience with uh, a wonderful group of people. It also, I think, gave me a perspective on my field. So much of the work I do is focused on transnational um, perspectives, geopolitics. And that, I think, is a result of that experience of, you know, living for an, a, a few years in very, very different environments. And so I think that really shaped the methodology and the kind of intellectual decisions I made as an academic subsequent. So what would, it, what would I have been if I hadn't, if I'd stayed home? Yes. Um, <laughs> I would like to say less interesting, um, but, <laughs> but you know, it's that counterfactual um, that we could never really, we can never really answer. Yeah. Um, so, so there wasn't a moment where you had two very distinct parts. So for example, speaking personally, um, after college, I had to make the choice and I took a year off to make this choice between going for a PhD in cell biology or going for my master's of fine arts in painting. Mm -hmm. So if I had gone left instead of right, we could be having a discussion now about painting. And actually we could still have a discussion about painting, <laughs> but, um, but you know, I could have actually turned into a painter, um, probably starved, but nevertheless, I, I could have been a painter. So there's not a Caroline um, that's a musician or an engineer or a... Well, you know what's interesting? So I feel like I kind of live that now in these two jobs we've talked oh, about. Um, so I'm, there is a Carolyn uh, who talks, you know, business models and strategy. And then there's a Carolyn who, you know, talks W.E.B. Du Bois and geopolitics and and those kind of coexist maybe it's because i'm a you know i'm a um gemini i don't know but there was not a competing career path that lured me right right that's for sure yeah by the way we probably won't won't include this in the recording but i didn't know you were a gemini i am also a gemini <laughs> All right. All right. There we go. <laughs> now we can. Uh, so hence the friendship. <laughs> yes. So Carolyn, you are you are living the multiverse. So in some ways, I think I kind of am actually. <laughs> exactly as am I. So I I certainly get that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So so let me ask you sort of one last question. So one of the taglines in Love Exchange is learning without limits. Mm -hmm. And especially when I started to teach courses focused on creativity, on modes of entrepreneurship, on ideation, etc., I still remember <clears throat> that the first time I taught um, a course in this area, I wanted my students to have 
the ultimate blue sky experience. No boundaries, no limitations. Choose your problem and come up with any idea you want in anything that you care about. And what I saw was that quite often students floundered. Mm -hmm. And in time, what I discovered from my own sort of um, naivete is that in fact, boundaries and limits can actually drive innovation, can drive creativity. You need almost to push against something mm -hmm. to really force yourself to be truly creative and to think out of the box. So what's often the case for so many of us is that as we think about our lives and our life history so far, there are hurdles, there are limitations, there are boundaries that we had to push against, that we had to overcome. So a question I have for you is that when you think back over your life so far, can you share with our viewers and listeners sort of perhaps um, a limit or a hurdle that you had to overcome that you think really helped forge who you are today? Wow, that's a big question. I know. <laughs> Take your time. Well, okay, so. Um... I, it, it's, I don't know if it's a boundary or a limitation in the way that you're describing, but, um, but my mother did not go to college. And in fact, she didn't graduate from high school. And I, and she's an amazingly smart woman. It was, you know, her father died. She had to take care of her mother. Um, and then she went on to work at the Canadian embassy and she, you know, so very much of her time. But I think that that fact and seeing such a smart person with that as kind of a, a backdrop and at times a real limit in her life, mm -hmm. I think that that is a large part of the reason that I, it was never a question if I, if I would go to college. Um, I did not even debate all that long or hard whether I would get an advanced degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that my deep commitment to higher education is a result of knowing the just the avenues it can open and when i say that i don't mean just you know career oh you know you make more money if you have a college degree i i'm i'm I think i'm really talking about just the the qualitative um the sense of self the sense of grappling with larger questions in environments of inquiry um, those kinds of experiences build a framework for living generally mm -hmm. that I, I feel passionately about. I really feel like that is, that is something we have to make sure as many people have as possible. And yes, it can look a lot of different ways. You know, it doesn't have to look like it. It looks for the students at your university and my university, Rob, but I think providing that is, a, you know, it's so important to human well being. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's really hard to remember that, to put a, a tagline on that. So we talk about, you know, career preparedness or, um, vocational training or those those things which are easier to see and easier to collect data on but I I actually think and maybe you were getting at this earlier with um, a couple of your questions and comments I mean I I actually think that you know maybe it's the humanities it doesn't have to be the humanities I think there are, as I said the logic course even the and now I'm dating myself even the Fortran course, <laughs> Fortran, that's what I took. 
<laughs> the Latin. Of, of, <laughs> so, you know, even those, right, what you learn when you watch and, and understand a system at work and how you can uh, maneuver the system and work, work within the system and its constraints. I, I just think that is something that we, um, you know, we as, as a community of educators, you know, we can't forget that, that that's really what we're about. And so maybe that's an, maybe it's not a constraint as much as an early provocation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That I carry, I didn't, I, it's not a hurdle I jumped. It's, uh, it's a mindfulness I carry with me. I will say though, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of insecurity that comes, you know, with that and can I do it? And, yeah. you know, so that being first, um, I think. Yes. It, yes. Yeah. So of course, I, I completely understand yet another thing that we share because mm -hmm. neither of my parents went to college either. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> what was even stranger is that, and actually I enjoy telling my students about this. So I grew up in Jamaica mm -hmm. and there wasn't the internet, right? And so <laughs> you can imagine when I decided on my own that I'm going to go to college in the United States, I had to write, handwrite a letter, mm -hmm. put a stamp on it, mail it to the U.S. Three mm -hmm. weeks later, a six page pamphlet from a mm -hmm. college would come maybe one or two photos in color, but I think not. Yeah. And I had to read that pamphlet like I was reading, you know, <laughs> some major tome and make a decision, right? So, it, but, but, but you're right. I think um, that's a case where there is a provocation, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. you, sort of, you sort of respond to that. So you're right. It's not necessarily a limit, but it's something that inspires, provokes, mm -hmm. pushes you. That's right. No, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. So, um, Carolyn, thank you so much for sharing that um, with us. And thank you for taking the time from what I know is on a completely crazy schedule, given all the hats that you wear at Rice, um, to spend time with us, to share basically your perspectives on the humanities, on teaching and learning, on university leadership, and also how COVID-19 is really affecting all of this. So I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much.